We are going to start with number 457. I love to tell the story. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Our next song will be 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Our next song will be 511. Our next song is 223, Crown Him with Many Crowns. <coughs>
Our next song is 330. Oh, did we just do that one? No. No? Okay. 330. Take my life and let it be. Next song is number 21. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. wonderful singers, and then to hear you guys singing along uh, with them. So thank you for participating. I have a few announcements, and we'll move around uh, rapidly. Um, we have started prayer meeting, and it is 6 o'clock on um, Wednesday evening, and we'd like to ask you to participate I in this. We have in the past have had some wonderful answers of prayer to prayer because of getting together and, and um, praying together. Which brings me to the fact that next week I'm going to be preaching on prayer. And so come and, and learn more about how to pray and how to um, make your prayers the best that you can. Um, Su Susan and Jeff Watson, we'd like you to pray for them. They have been um, sick. Um, a couple things that you guys can participate in if you want to. Um, the first one is the church board. Do you know that you can actually come and see what's going on? Nope, I hear somebody. Well, I'm letting you know. How's that? It's at 6.30 Monday evening. We have in the past on church board, we've had uh, members come, and you know, they help bring a different insight to some of the things that we discuss, and it can even help us make um, better decisions. Um, the school board is also meeting on Wednesday at 6.30, We'd like you to invite the future of, this, of our school. So that's at 6.30. April 15th, who's coming? Jamie George. Now, although this is a fundraising event for scholarship at our school, one of the things I was listening to him last night, and one of the things that I hear again and again in his discussion is... He wanting to reach out to people and introduce them to God and Christ. So this is also an opportunity for you to invite friends um, and uh, relatives and anybody in the community that you run into and get acquainted with. Please come out and support the concert. Um, there is a walk through Bethlehem planning uh, meeting on Thursday, March 15th at 6.30, so please come and uh, participate in that. I'm kind of excited that we're going to do that again this year. We haven't done it for a while, and I've enjoyed it when I participated. There's just something about that time of the year that brings you closer to, to Christ. Gerald. Well, you know, there's one reason I usually get up here and say something, but I want to key on something she just said. 
<coughs> in regard to Jamie George, so that's not really why I'm standing here, but Jamie George uh, is an interesting artist because we know him because he's been here. But he's got a fantastic story, and I was looking up some lyric the other day on my smartphone, and I don't even remember the song, but what struck me was is that the very first thing that came up was Jamie George. This guy is a world-renowned violinist and known by many, many famous artists, which I don't know their names, but the point is that when he's the first one that comes up on a search and he's coming here, this is the kind of guy that you want to tell your friends that he's coming because if they don't know who he is, they will know who he is just by a little bit of a search on his name and the opportunity to come and hear him personally here would be very, very exciting. So if you know of Jamie George, think of those um, concerts that you've heard. If you haven't heard of him, look him up and read his story. It's a compelling story that he'll tell in person and you will, be, you will really enjoy his music. So anyway, I just wanted to reinforce that because he's not just some guy trying to promote this school. He goes all over the world and performs for audiences of all, all, all sizes. So anyway, the reason I am here is to th offer thanks to God for a couple reasons. One is um, that our building is really coming along very nicely. And it's at a stage now where it's really detailed, so we're looking for some specific positions. Last week we had um, sanding and staining of the, of the handrails. That's going to occur again, and those people, I was told, those people that showed up, thank you very much because it worked really well. And if you're able to come back, and I don't know you by name, but I know there was a handful of people that showed up. If you're able to come back, Dwight was thrilled to have you there. And if somebody else wants to come and join along, please do. But basically, the emphasis will be uh, sanding and staining the handrails. Uh, there's lots of other work to do. Uh, it's somewhat at this point limited because of materials that are coming in. So please come if you're, if you're interested in helping out Sunday and Dwight will be heading that up. Also, another piece of praise, this might be something that most of you don't know about, but we had a fire alarm in the new building. The fire department was on site, and praise the Lord, there was no fire. I would chalk it up knowing what I know about it is that it's kind of a teething problem with the new building. In other words, you know how new cars, they break in and new engines break in? Well, new buildings have their little idiosyncrasies and little foibles, and so we're working our way through that. And so I'm thanking the Lord there's no big deal, no damage, and um, so we're moving forward and we're excited about it. So please come out if you're interested in helping, or even if you just want to take a look around, it's pretty neat to see. And we'll be soon putting in carpeting and finishing up. So that being said, thank you and happy Sabbath. We will open with hymn number one. Praise to the Lord. Please stand.
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your presence in this place. Thank you even more for your presence in our lives. Lord, we ask that your spirit will come and will be in this place. We give him free and full access to our lives today so that we can hear you speaking to our hearts. Still the, the busyness of, of our hectic week now, and help us to tune our hearts to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Seated. Before you're seated. Well, maybe you want to sit down and come back up again. We'd like you to greet the people that are around you. Wish them a happy Sabbath and that they have come today. Hey. So I know you're excited to see each other, but let's go ahead and sit down so that we can have our children's story. It's time for the children's story, and, and at this time the children love to come around and pick up your offering for the little lamb's offering, which goes towards our children's ministries. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> so my story today is about um, how you need to be careful about what you're playing about and what you need to be careful about what you're doing. Um, so it starts off like this. One day the rain was pouring down in the classroom uh, outside so the children could not leave the classroom to play. One kid got the idea to go act out a play that he had seen in the theater the night before. 
So what he did was he said, one kid is the thief, one, thief, one kid is the drunken man, and one kid's the heroine. Well, the teacher decided that that was not such a smart idea, so he rapped on his desk. I don't want you playing that, play, doing that play. Why not, said the kid. And the teacher said, first listen to the story, and then I will tell you. Many years ago, there was a terrible disease in the city of London. It was called the Great Plague. When a person got, it, his disease, got the disease, he started swelling under the arms. His throat became extremely sore, and black spots appeared on his body. His temperature went very high, and he was more likely to die than recover. Thousands of people had fled the city. More than half of those who left, those left died of the plague. This disease was so catching, a law was passed that as soon as any person sickened with the plague, a certain mark must be put on the front door so that no one would go in. People lived in constant fear that they would not get the plague. Every night, a cart was driven through the city to carry away the bodies of those who had died th that day. Is this story true? <laughs> Asked Bill. Um, what I have told you is certainly true, said the teacher. I will leave it to you to decide if the rest of the story is true or not. In the city of London lived a widow with five children. She lived every day in constant fear of the plague, that the plague might be brought to her home. She told the children never to leave the house. She herself only went out when it was necessary to get food for the family. When she did, she covered her nose and mouth with a mask to guard against infection. One morning, this poor widow saw a sign of the plague on the door across the street on the house. She dreaded to leave the house that day, but she knew she must go to the market if she were to have anything to eat. From the window of the home, she showed her five children the mark of the plague and the house across the street. Then she said, be sure to stay in the house today. Do not go out hours for a single minute while I am gone. After the mother left, the oldest boy said, I'm going across the street to see how that mark is made. I'll go with you, said the second boy. I have a piece of chalk so we can copy it. Boys, anyways. <laughs> The other children said, Mother told us not to leave the house. Be quiet, said the two older boys, and they were off. When they were gone, the others said, What shall we do? We must not go outside. What can we do in the house? Tim said, Let's play catching the plague. Jane, we'll put some black marks on you. Then you lie on the floor as if you are almost dead. I'll be the doctor and try to cure you. <laughs> but I can't, so I'll say you are dead. When I say Jane is dead, then you, Mark, bring your wagon and we'll put her in it. Then you wheel it, it into the kitchen. Jane, you must not move or speak after you are dead. As the mother returned from the market, she looked fearfully at every house for new signs of the plague. As she neared home, she was horrified to see her two oldest boys playing across the street um, of the infected house. She rushed across the street, seized them by the arm, dragged them across into their own home. Just as she got inside the front door, she heard Tim say, Jane is dead. <laughs> it was only part of the play, but the poor mother did not know this. She fell fainting to the floor. The children were very much frightened. When at last their mother opened her eyes again, she saw all of her children standing around her with anxious faces. She knew that Jane was not dead and none of them had yet caught the plague. But she was so weak from the scare that she had to spend the rest of the day in bed. Now, what do you think of the story, so, asked the teacher. I don't believe it. Those big plague was too terrible to play with, but there's something more terrible to play with. Death came into the world because of sin. I never thought about sin being so awful before, Bill said. I can see why you don't want us to play getting drunk and stealing and things like that. I'm glad you understand, said Mr. Thorne. Now, to make up from stopping your play, we'll take time to, out of the afternoon to dramatize any story in your reader that you choose. The end. You may go back to your seats. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Thank you, Tegan, for that wonderful children's story. Today, the offering is from um, the Adventist World Radio. And 
I would like to read a scripture from the Bible, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. And this is from the King James Version. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, and all, pardon me, I am with you always, and even unto the end of the world. Amen. Will the, the ushers please stand? A little prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you please bless this monies, these monies that are gathered today here in your name, Lord. And let it be spread out to all those where the areas it need to be reached. And for us all to give abundantly to our hearts, content, Lord, and just help us to be cheerful givers, Lord. And that we may remember that it's not ours to give, but it is yours that we must give. Because you give us no other option but to give and be a cheerful giver. It's your commandment. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Ryan. This is my wife, Kayla. You can see in the bulletin. Uh, we've met many of you, but not all of you. So we hope that uh, the more of you we get to meet, uh, the more friends we will make. We are so happy that you guys are here today. This is the nicest day of this early spring so far, and you have chosen to come and worship together with all of us. So our scripture today is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 33. And this is Christ talking. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Good morning. I'm Kayla, as Ryan introduced me. Um, this morning for prayer, I would love for all of us to stand up together. And as you stand, I want you to kind of get close to your neighbor, and I want you to reach out, and I want you to grab the hand of your neighbor. I don't have a hand. <laughs> <laughs> if God has blessed you in some way this week, I want you to give your neighbor's hand a squeeze. Hopefully you all felt a little squeeze out there. Sometimes when we pray, it can feel like our prayers are going nowhere, maybe hitting the ceiling and falling back down. 
sometimes we cry out to God and it, it feels like, where do those words go? And this morning, as you hold that hand, as you feel the warmth or maybe the cold clamminess of the hand in yours, that concrete feeling, that is just that same concreteness, that is how real our prayers are to God. Just as you can feel that hand in yours, our prayers to our Heavenly Father are just that real, even when it doesn't feel like it, even when we're in a dark spot. So as we hold each other's hands and as we reflect on these things, let's bow our heads and talk to our Creator God. Lord in heaven, thank you so much for challenging us, for asking us to pray to you. When you were here on this earth, you set an example with your own prayers. You cried out, you spoke out, you cried tears, you rejoiced, you talked to God, your Father. And here we are this morning, hand in hand, bowed head, doing the same as you did in your steps. You are our example, and we are so thankful for that. As we are here together as your congregation, Lord, I want to lift up our members of our church body who are present and those who are not. So we read through our bulletin. We know there are many, many, many of us who have health challenges physical health needs, things that just aren't going right. Lord, I want to pray for a healing in our hearts this morning, not only for those physical needs, Lord, but for those spiritual needs that we all have, those spiritual wounds that we all have. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit fills our hearts this morning, that we have the miracle of your healing in our lives, that as we stand here hand in hand with each other, that we can go from this place being renewed, refreshed, rejuvenated because we've spent time with you, because we've communed with you. Thank you for Sabbath, this holy day of the week that we come together where we can soak you up and be nourished. We love you, Lord, and we are excited. We're excited to someday stand hand in hand with you. We pray these things in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Great job, Karen, from one string player to another. That was awesome. So anyone who uh, picks up the violin or the cello or the viola or whatever else, it uh, takes a good amount of courage to do that. Well, it's good to be here, and uh, the drive up was just amazing, and um, it's not often you get a sunny day this time of year, so uh, to have, have a day that's just worth uh, driving for and to see the mountains, and uh, it was just fantastic, so we were, we were wishing that we were headed to the mountains today, um, but you know, we are, we are headed to a mountaintop this morning as we open up his word. Um, and as we spend some time considering how God's Word is going to impact our lives. So I pray that today um, we can experience God in a new and a fresh way. Let's invite His presence as we spend this time together. Lord Jesus, as we open Your Word, it is imperative that our ears be tuned to You. Uh, my words, Lord, are, are meaningless unless... I am touched with your spirit, and uh, let that same spirit moves um, in our hearts. Lord, my job today is to bring your word from my lips to the ears of the congregation, but may you move that message from their ears to their heart. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know it sounds odd, but the kingdom of heaven really is like fruitcake. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to start with a story it took place when I was in seminary. I was in a youth ministry class, and we decided to drive to Chicago from Bering Springs to a large mega church down there in Chicago because we were going to learn what true youth ministry was all about. We arrived at the large sanctuary, and as we entered into the lobby, the 50s music was blaring, all those great classic 50s hits that some of you may remember. Uh, and I thought, well, this is kind of different. I've never been to church where they're playing 50s music, but I'll go with it. And this is, a, after all, what youth ministry is all about. And, and then we got into the sanctuary, and uh, the music was blaring again. And, and right away, they said, all right, everybody, it's going to be a great day, and we're going to have so much fun. And the first thing we're going to do today is we are going to have a crowd surfing race. I thought, well, now this is really different. Never done that before. And so there they were. They got uh, <coughs> two young people, uh, one on each side of, of the church. We won't try it today. I'll just describe it. And um, <laughs> I put one teen up with everyone's arms. And the race was to get to the back of the sanctuary first. It was great fun. But again, I've never done that in church before. And um, so the service went on. That wasn't all fun and games. There was some points where... God's word was open. There was some time where they talked about what it meant to, to live for Christ uh, in the public school setting. But it was a unique service. It was something I'd never experienced before. And all the way back to Marion Springs in the van, we were talking about what next generation ministry really looks like. Is, is that what it is? Do we, do we have to crowd surf in the sanctuary to truly be effective? Do we have to blare 50s music from the loudspeakers to really reach this generation? What does next generation ministry look like? Some years have passed since that visit to that church. And a lot of research and studies have been done. A lot of um, alarming statistics have begun to emerge about what's happening in Next Generation Ministry today. One out of every two young people as they transition from high school into college will drift out of the church. In fact, with, within the first few weeks of college, and, and anyone, any, anyone heading into college here, uh, you need to know that your first two weeks in college will set the spiritual trajectory for the next four years of your life if not beyond. Uh, and so many young people get into college, they treat their faith like a jacket, something I can take on and off when I want. So I hang with my friends, the jacket comes off. My parents come to visit, the jacket comes on, we go to church, we act like everything's the same. 
but the faith is never their own, and so they drift. The sad reality is that there is no major denomination within the United States today that is growing. Now, we can look at the Adventist church as a whole, and we can see growth worldwide, but look at the growth or lack thereof within the United States. What growth is happening is often happening within immigrant populations. Uh, there's no major Christian tradition today that's growing. There is a rise of what's known as the religious nuns, those that say, I have no religion, none at all. That's gone from 16% several years ago now to 23%. 18 to, 29, 18 to 29 year olds make up 17% of the population, and yet in, as within Christianity as a whole, they make up only 10% of attendance on a, on a weekly basis. Where are they going? What's happening in their world? question I have for you is, does it have to be this way? Does, and I agree with you. Thank you for saying that, because I don't think it has to be that way. I don't think that ministry, youth ministry, young adult ministry has to be in decline. I don't think we have to see a drift of one out of every two. There was a study done several years ago by the Fuller Youth Institute. They surveyed um, Many, many churches, 1,300 interviews, 10,000 hours of research, 10,000 pages of transcripts from all those interviews. Half of the churches they, that they surveyed were, were predominantly not white. Very interestingly, they, they did all sizes, all ethnic backgrounds. They looked at Christianity as a whole. What they found was very interesting. Six key characteristics. Six key characteristics that make up what they call a church that is growing young. You'll see them here. Of course, at, right at the center of everything is a Jesus-centered community. That lies at the heart of everything that we do. But what are these six key char characteristics? Key chain leadership. Passing on leadership to the next generation. Empathizing with young people today. Understanding who they are, what makes them tick. Placing Jesus' message front and center in everything that we do. Creating a warm community. Very interesting. They say the warm is the new cool. We don't need pastors in skinny jeans that play the electric guitar and, and really good at basketball. What they need is a church community that is truly warm and caring and loves them for who they are. Churches that are growing young prioritize youth and family everywhere. Across the board, they prioritize it. And then churches that are growing young do everything they can, everything they can, to be the best neighbor. Fascinating. I want to look at three of these characteristics today. Not with, through the eyes of research, but through the eyes of Scripture. We begin in Genesis chapter 18. You may want to go with, it, go with it, me to this verse. Genesis chapter 18 is a fascinating story. Abraham is sitting in his tent on a hot, hot day. You can, uh, you can picture that, that hot day. And he looks out of his tent down the road, and there are three strangers coming up the road. Now, in that day, it was imperative that the patriarch of the family, the head of the household, did everything within his power, utilized all of his resources to make sure that there was no one who was marginalized, no one who was on the outside looking in. He wanted to make sure that everyone was, was under the protection of what was known as the Father's house. And so he sees these three strangers and he says, they're in the heat of the day. They're, they're at risk. I can do something about it. And so he gets up from his tent. He does something that no self-respecting Jewish elder would have ever done. He ran to meet them. Notice what happens in Genesis chapter 18. We'll start in verse 3. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not rise and pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat. 
so you can be refreshed in the going your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. And so Abraham hurried into the tent. And he said, Sarah, quick, he said, get three seahs or three measures of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Now this process of going out and bringing the marginalized into the father's house was known as redemption. It's where we get the biblical word. He redeems them. When I think of redemption, I think of fruitcake. And when I think of fruitcake, I think of my mother-in-law. Now, I know what you're thinking, but that's not where I'm going with this story. My mother-in-law is a very kind, gracious woman, very, very generous. And that's where the problem came on this particular Christmas season. I was not yet married to, to my wife, but I was there at the house visiting just prior to Christmas. And my mother-in-law said, we're going to make fruitcake. For all of our family, now you've got to picture this, they live in a family farm. And there's just house after house all over. Large, large family. So I said, okay, we're going to make fruitcake for everyone. She said, go down to, to the, the egg barn, because they had an egg business there on the farm, and get some eggs for the fruitcake. Well, how many eggs do we need? 56 eggs. We're making a lot of fruitcake, I guess. So we went, my wife and I got 56 eggs, cracked them all into this, this big, huge pot on the kitchen floor, and we started mixing in all the ingredients, the flour and the sugar and all the nuts and the, the fruit and whatever else went into it. By now, we're, we've got this massive pot of, of dough. We're stirring it with a, a spoon the size of a canoe paddle, you know. And, and, and so we, we then begin to get all the pans we've got and make these pans of fruitcake, and it, the, the countertop is covered with pans of fruitcake, and the, the table is covered with pans of fruitcake, and we have all, all the pans loaded up, and we look at all the pans, and we look at the one oven that we have, and we realize we have miscalculated in, in, in a very serious way. What are we going to do? So that, well, let's call all the family. And so we called all the family and say, hey, can we borrow your ovens? We're making your fruitcake for you. So I uh, hope you don't mind if we borrow your oven. And so we took fruitcake all over the farm, square mile, all over the farm, loaded all their ovens up, kept track of when they needed to come out, went back around, picked up all the fruitcake. And we had fruitcake for the entire family. It was amazing, if you like fruitcake. Yeah. So Abraham says to Sarah, Sarah, I want you to go, and I want you to get three measures of the, the very best flour we have. And make some bread. Now, when I hear that verse, I say, Sarah goes to the kitchen. She gets three cups of flour. She makes a nice little loaf of bread. After all, she's only serving three people. You want to know how much three measures of flour is? Take a look. It's more than a bushel of flour. 144 cups of flour. Enough to make 52 loaves of bread. That's a standard American-sized loaves of bread. 832 slices, enough for 416 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That is, if you have 33 jars of jelly and 64 jars of peanut butter lying around the house. Sarah made a lot of bread. A lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But it didn't end there. Abraham goes to the servants and says, Now I want you to go kill the fatted calf that we've been saving for a special occasion and barbecue all the meat. A fatted calf is enough food to feed a village for several days or more. And they did it all for three strangers. Three strangers wandering down the road who needed to come under the protection of the Father's house. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, he wants to, to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like, is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with, the NIV says, about 60 pounds of flour. But the actual measurement there is three seahs, or three measures of flour. Now, all the good Jews in the audience would say, oh, I know what Jesus is doing. I know what he's saying. The kingdom of heaven is like Sarah and Abraham, who see three strangers in the road, and they, they make Tons and tons of bread. 416 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for those three strangers. That's 
That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. We look around our church community and we see young people who, are, who have been marginalized, who are on the outside looking in. We watch as 50% of our young people go from high school into college and drift away from the church. And we say, that's really too bad. We should, someone ought to do something about that. Maybe I'll pray about that. Prayer is always a good thing. But Abraham killed the fatted calf for three marginalized strangers. Abraham made up hundreds of loaves of bread for three marginalized strangers. He gave the very best that he had to bring those three under the protection of the Father's house. The question is, what are you willing to do for just one marginalized young person who needs to know that there's a place for her, a place for him within the safety of the Father's house? Are you willing to give your very best? Are you willing to give all that you have? You say, but if we, if we prioritize young people and make them the center of everything we do, then, then where do I fit in as, a, as a, an adult or even as a senior adult? I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it kind of mean that we just have one very narrow focus? How do I fit into that? We have a new baby in our family. I've not met her yet. That's Harper. Uh, my niece's second child. Now, when Harper comes to, to the, the house, my parents' house, uh, there is no one who's left out. Most of all, my mom. Uh, because when Harper's there, she just takes that child and loves that child. And everything centers around that little girl in that family. But there's something about a child in the midst of of a family. I mean, you know what it's like, but at Christmas time when there's a new baby in the family, everybody's ooing and aahing and wanting to hold it, but nobody's left out. Nobody feels marginalized. No, we, we all have a role, we all have a place in caring for that precious child. And that's the truth of it. When we focus on the emerging generations, when we make them the, the heart and center of what we're all about, passing faith from one generation to the next, the entire church rises. The entire church. Rises. And so the first model of youth ministry is the redemptive model of youth ministry. It says we're going to do everything we can to bring the marginalized into the safety of the Father's house. The next model of youth ministry is what I like to call the empathetic model of youth ministry. Come with me to the Gospel of Mark. I want us to look at one of my favorite stories out of Scripture. I say that knowing that I've got like 10 million of them, but that's okay. Mark chapter 5. It's really two stories in one. We, we, we begin with the, uh, the story of Jairus. Jairus comes running to Jesus and says, My daughter's about to die. You've got to come quick. And, and so Jesus now is, is pushing his way through the crowd trying to get to Jairus' house in time. And that's when we meet her. That woman who's been huddling off to the side of the crowd. This woman who has been subject to bleeding, the NIV says in chapter 5, starting in, in verse 25, subject to bleeding for 12 years. And she's been to doctor after doctor, and all they do is take her money and make her worse. And, and with the, 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 the problem that she had, she was richly unclean. People couldn't touch her. She couldn't go to the synagogue. She was an outcast, broken, hurting for 12 years. And she says, if, if, I, could just, if I could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, through all those healings and the tassels of the garment. That's what the scripture says about the Messiah. So if that's true, then if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And so she works her way to the right spot so that she can be right where he, she needs to be when Jesus passes by and she reaches out and she touches his garment. I love what happens next. Verse 30 
It says that once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the disciples, uh, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus knew there was some unfinished business here with this woman. It wasn't enough for the woman to touch and, and be healed and drift off in the crowd. There was more work that needed to be done. And so he keeps searching for her. He kept looking, it says verse 32, Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear. And I love what it says next. She told him, she told him the whole story. She told him the whole story, or as some versions say, the whole truth. Now, it takes a while to tell the story of 12 years of pain, 12 years of heartache. It takes a long time to tell the whole story. And so I imagine that Jesus bent down on the curb of that street, if there was one, next to this broken woman, with Jairus tugging at his arms, like, you got to hurry, my daughter's about to die. And he sits, and he listens to her whole story. All of it, the pain, the brokenness, the abuse, the, 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 the suffering, the tears, the loneliness, wondering if God is really there, and he listens to it all. And then he reaches out, and he brushes away a tear. And he says these words. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, to understand what's happening in these words, you need to understand what's going on in Jesus' touch. When the woman sat there thinking about what she wanted, she said, if, if I could just touch the hem of Je Jesus' garment, I would be made whole. The word there is sozo. I would be completely healed inside and out. That's what she wanted. That's what she was after. But it says when she reached out, and touched his garment. She didn't get what she was after. All she got was she was cured. She, the physical suffering was gone, but she wasn't truly made whole. But after Jesus listens to her brokenness and, and listens to the 12 years of pain, he reaches out and he brushes the tear away and he says, Daughter, your faith has sozoed you. Now you're whole. What makes the difference? How did she move from getting physical curing to being made whole? It was the listening ear of Jesus. It was Jesus sitting on the curb with her and hearing her story of brokenness and pain. It's what gave her what she so desperately needed. That word empathy is a powerful word. To empathize with someone is to feel with them. It's to sit in the curb with them and listen to their story. To not judge, to, to not criticize, just to listen, just to be with that person. Now you understand the empathetic model of next generation ministry. The one common denominator in young people today is the hurt and the pain that they bear. And there are whole books and research done on this, which we don't need to go into today. But I can tell you, as a camp director, I see it summer after summer. And what young people need today is someone to sit in the curb with them and let them tell their story of pain and brokenness. To be known for who they truly are. To be accepted and valued as the person that they truly are.
before we get to the leadership model, one short story. We welcomed a, a, a young woman into our home to stay with us for several months. She was in a transition period, needed a place to stay while she got enough money to get an apartment of her own. And we welcomed her in, gave her a room. Our kids were off at, at college, and so the, at least one of them was, so they had an extra room. And she would come home at the, at the long day of work, and she'd disappear into her bedroom. You, know, you almost never see her, even though we knew her, um, but just kind of disappeared. And, and then when I came home from work, and she's sitting on the couch, and she said, Pastor Dave, we need to talk. I got questions. I got things to, to ask you. So she began to ask questions, but it very quickly moved in to her telling her story. She began to talk about what it was like growing up in, in, a, in that border town in Mexico, just uh, in, in Mexico, and the violence, the, the huge level of violence, the fear of just walking to the, the corner store. And she talked about what it was like growing up. And then she talked about some of the painful experiences in her life and how that led her to, to run away from home. To, to fall in with a, with a really rough lot. And her life just took a dark, dark turn. And, and she began to tell the story. And uh, periodically as she told the story, she would, she would pause and, and she would wait as if to say, if I tell you this, will you still want me in, in, in your home? If I tell you this part of my story, will you still accept me? And we'd listen. For an hour and a half, she told her story until finally it was... Time for her to go to bed. She had to get up the early next morning. She came back the next evening. Didn't rush off to her room. She, she sat down at the dinner table. She had supper with us. And as we ate, she completed the story of how God, in that dark, dark place, rescued her and, and brought her back uh, bit by bit uh, until she found the forgiveness she so desperately needed and found wholeness once again. And, and the story is all done. She pushed back from her chair and, and, and just waited for what our response would be. And we wrapped our arms around this girl, told her that we loved her, told her that we were so glad that she was here, so glad that she had told us her story. And from that point on, she never rushed back to her bedroom again. She came out. She sat with us. She, she visited, visited with us. She called us her family. Uh, at Christmas time, we, she insisted, insisted that we get a family picture and that she be at the center of it all. Something had changed because we had heard her story. The empathetic model of next generation ministry. It doesn't take anything fancy to do that. It doesn't take a drum set and smoke machines. I have no problem with those things, but it doesn't take those things. It doesn't take a pastor in skinny jeans and an electric guitar. All it takes is, is someone, you. It doesn't matter how old you are or anything. Just to sit in the curb, sit in the pew with someone and say, tell me your story and just listen. The last model of, of next generation ministry is the leadership model of youth ministry. I want you to come to the book of Acts, another one of my favorite stories. The book of Acts, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 14, starting in verse 8, the story of Paul in the little tiny town of Lystra, and there it is, what's left of it anyway, just a few acres at the top of a, of a little mound, that was Lystra. Out in the middle of nowhere. Now Paul had big dreams of going to Rome and changing the world. And yet God kept calling him out further and further into the, the Galatian uh, countryside. And he must have wondered, God, what are you up to? Finally he comes to this little tiny town of Lystra. Notice what happens in verse 8. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had the faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. At that, at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. <clears throat> Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priests of Zeus whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and, and wreaths to the city gates because 
he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, uh, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and they rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We are only men, human like you. We are bringing you the good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made, the hev who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. And he goes on to share the good news. But then in, in verse 19, it says, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. It's amazing how the crowd one day will be singing your praises, considering you a God. The next day, as it says, they're trying to stone you. Not only trying to stone you, they did. They dragged Paul and Silas out of the city and they stoned Paul, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up. I love Paul. He got up and he went back into the city. I don't, Paul is my kind of guy, you know? I mean, no fear. You're going to stone me? You know, maybe, maybe I didn't make myself clear. Let's try this again. And so he goes back into the city. And he starts again. Paul goes to this little tiny town four times throughout the course of his ministry. This tiny town that tried to kill him four times. I mean, I'd never go back again after that. I think I would have gotten the hint. Paul doesn't. Why? Because there was someone in Lystra that Paul saw potential in. He was a young boy. Just a, a young kid with everything going against him. He was, he was a half-breed, a mumser, as, as, the, as the Jews called that. He was part Jew, part Gentile. I, I can imagine as this young Jewish girl chose to get married to this Greek man, that the rabbis must have said, don't you know what you're doing? Don't you know that, that your child, if you have a child out of this union, will, will never be part of the Jewish faith, will never be welcomed into the synagogue, could never join the rabbi's school. It can't be done. Don't you know? And she does it anyway. And her little boy, as he grows up, begins to love the scriptures, love the things of God. And yet, he's not welcomed in that Jewish community. He must have sat outside the synagogue school trying to, to listen through an open window, maybe hearing what was going on, but he knew he could never go inside. He longed to, to be able to follow a rabbi, to, to truly uh, become a disciple of a great teacher. But he knew that no teacher would have him because he was a half-breed. Paul comes to the city of Lystra. In fact, many people feel that it was to this boy's home that he came after he was stoned. That's Christian tradition. Whether it's true or not, who knows? Paul meets this boy and says, there's something special about Timothy. Something special about Timothy. And so he comes back at the risk of his own life again and again and again to grow and develop this young boy. And then there comes a day, and I would have loved to have been there, when Paul comes to Timothy and says, Timothy, I know you can't go to to the synagogue. I know you can't go to rabbi school, but I want to be your rabbi. I want you to follow me as I follow Jesus. Will you come and journey with me? Learn from me. And, and, and Timothy, who thought this day would never come, gladly accepts. And Paul, bit by bit, begins to train and teach him until finally he hands over the leadership of the church at Ephesus to him. Just as a young man. He says, don't let anyone look down on your youth, he says to him. God's got great plans for you. He trains him to become a great leader. Paul was, in my book, one of the greatest youth pastors there ever was. He understood how to develop leadership in the next generation. It happened for me to this man right here. 
I don't know if any of you know Les Rylea. Um, he was the youth director in the Michigan Conference for many, many years. Camp director, youth director. He was my camp director. And um, I remember I worked for two summers for him. Started as a 17-year-old kid. At the, the end of my second summer, I was 18, just graduating from college. Or, or high school, rather. And he came to me and said, I want you to be my program director next summer. I thought, you got to be kidding me. I, I, I'm barely out of high school here. You want me to do it? Yeah, I want you to do it. And so I said, okay. He said, but now, he said, if, if you agree to this, I've got to have a two-year commitment. You've got to work for me at least two more years. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And um, I remember that freshman year in high school, I was at Andrews University starting to work on, on what pr plays and programs that we were going to do. And I, I called up Les Riley and I said, here's what I'm thinking of doing. I want to make sure that, that you like what I'm, what I'm doing. And so I'm going to run all this stuff by you. And he said, no, no, no. You don't need to, to call me up for every decision. You don't need to, to run everything past me. I trust you. That's why I chose you. I trust you. So just do the job. That was the way he was. And there wasn't a one of us on staff who wanted to disappoint this man, who trusted us, who gave us leadership abilities. We would do anything for him. And, and when we did make mistakes and we, and we did fail, we, we just felt horrible about it. But Les Rylea always had my back. And when the day came that I got a call from the Iowa-Missouri Conference to get sponsored by them, to go to seminary and then to end up pastoring, in the Iowa-Missouri Conference. I really didn't want to go to Iowa, Missouri. I didn't know anybody in Iowa, Missouri. I had always dreamed of working in the Michigan Conference. So I went to Les and I said, Les, I, I know I'm, I've just barely finished my sophomore year in, in college. And, you know, I've, got, I've got two weeks to get back to, to Iowa, Missouri. I'd really like to work in the Michigan Conference. What can you do for me? He said, give me, give me a couple days. A couple days later, the ministerial secretary from the Michigan Conference came up to camp where I was working, interviewed me, offered me the job. All because of that man going to bat for me. I'm in ministry today because of Les Rylea. Uh, my guess is some of you have someone in your life who played that role, who mentored you, who guided you, who shepherded you, who made you the person, man or woman, that you are today. That's youth leadership. It's about taking young people and bringing them into load-bearing leadership within the church. You've you got to get this. Load-bearing leadership isn't just, oh, come read Scripture. Anybody can read Scripture. Although the Scripture was read very well today. There, there he is. Nicely done today. But anybody can do it pretty much, right? Um, load-bearing leadership is if I take that person out of their position, things might begin to fall apart. That's a load-bearing wall. You guys just built a church. You know this. Your load-bearing walls, you don't mess with those walls, right? You take them out, the whole building comes down. You need to put your young people into load-bearing roles within the church so that if they, don't, if they aren't there, the structure begins to crumble. So what if they make mistakes? It's okay. I bet you make mistakes, right? We all do. And the beauty of that, the beauty of being a family of God is that we come around each other. Now, here's the idea about being a family of God. We like to think, yeah, we're a family of God. We're the parents and the young people. We're training them up. That's not the way it works. God is our father. We're all siblings in Christ, right? So you might be an older brother or an older sister, but that's, that's the most you get. We're, we're together in this journey. And, and so we come alongside our young people, our young adults, and we say, Let's do this together. Let's do church together. That's what the leadership model of youth ministry looks like. Growing young isn't about changing youth ministry. It isn't about surface things. It is about cultural change within the church. Radical change within the church. You say, oh, that, that's scary. I don't like that. that that's, that's too much pressure. I, I want you to take a look at someone's life. A short video clip. Um, his name is Myron. And, and Myron exemplifies what this kind of cultural change looks like. I want to take some of the fear out of it. 
take a look at his story. Hopefully it'll play. This is a picture taken at the prom. I was chaperoning and a bunch of the guys on the basketball team came up and wanted to have their picture taken with me. I'm in touch with most of them today. Some of these guys will call me boss man or big dog or G my. There was a 10th grade boy who asked one time, would I meet with him to do a Bible study? So I did every week for three years and uh, he's now 35 living in Dallas and we're still in touch and he comes to see me whenever he's in town. On Monday, I'm gonna get together with a, a man now 60 years of age who I took to a Young Life camp in 1974. I got a direct message from this girl I'd never met before. She said, hey, Myron, you don't know me, but I just wanted to say I admire you. You changed so many lives for the better and help people strengthen their faith in God. I know you're going through a tough time, but just know everyone loves you and is praying for you. I've been getting so much of this lately, so many texts and messages from kids telling me they're praying for me, thanking me for the impact I've had on their life. Kids sometimes will say nice things about me and I have to say whatever kindness or goodness you see in me, it's all because of Jesus in me. Young people today need and want and are looking for adults who will take the time to listen to their stories without judgment, without criticism. And I realize that through contacts with adults who really care about them, there are opportunities to share the love of Jesus with them. kept a, a notebook, he saw it there, with pictures of every young person he ever ministered to or was ever involved in. And um, sh just a short while after that video was filmed, uh, Myron passed away. The church, it was a large church that, that he was a part of, uh, was so full that they, they, they were literally in, in every spare room in the church, everybody came and wanted to be a part. One man, one man, Nothing special about him, nothing extraordinary about him. He just loved kids. You, you want to understand the, the cultural change we're talking about. We're not talking about needing to, to do radical things, unless you think of loving kids as radical. But, but that's what it takes. It takes reorientating your whole church, reorientating your own life, around looking to the next generation saying, I want to, to pour my life into them. I want to make sure that they know that they're loved and they're valued and that there's a place not only in this church for them, but there's a place at the foot of the cross for them. And, and that's amazing stuff. Next generation ministry is redemptive. It is about looking for that one young person who is marginalized, you know, it's okay if, if they're out there and they, they just got that brand new tattoo that they're really proud of. You know, it's okay if they just dyed their hair purple. 
Uh, it's okay if all the rumors say they've been using drugs. You find that one person. You go where they are and you love them. And, and you, then you practice empathetic ministry and you listen. Just tell me your story. I, I want to I wanna know who you are. I had one young girl tell me, she said, my church, they love to say that they know me, but they have no idea who I am. No one in my church has ever taken the time to truly listen to my story. Don't let that be the story of your congregation. Let them know who you truly are. And then take those young people who are so broken, who are so messed up, apparently, um, but, and so in need of Jesus, and say, you know what? I see something in you worth developing. I see potential in you. Let me begin to hand over the keys of leadership to you. The scariest thing parents ever do is hand the car keys off to their child, right? Okay, go drive. And how reticent we are to hand over the keys to the church, even to young adults. Some of these young adults are out uh, running large businesses. I knew one young adult, he was, he was commanding a, a Navy ship, but his own church wouldn't give him the keys. Really? Give him the keys. Not just the physical keys, but give them the, the, the power and the ability to affect change within your congregation. That's important stuff. You do these things, your church will never be the same again. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So I want to challenge you to become a part of a movement that is taking place across this country. Uh, it's called Growing Young Adventist. You're going to hear more about this. Um, but those six core principles, we're passionate within the Washington Conference about bringing those to life within the local congregation. There are three churches right now that are going through a year-long cohort process to begin to model this and, and to, to bring it out in their own life, in their, of, in, in their own congregations. And uh, we hope that that's going to grow and, and continue to, to expand. You'll hear more about it. We'll... We'll hope that your church will say, you know, we're going to take this seriously. We want to grow young. We want to see that 18 to 26-year-old really making a difference in our congregation. And uh, the journey's just beginning, all right? The journey's just starting. And God has great things in store. And I pray today that you will embrace these models of ministry and um, embrace the young people and young adults within your congregation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you've, you've laid out truly what, what biblical young adult and, and, and youth leader ministry is all about. And it's not about the, the crazy games and, and, and the, the lights and the show. It's, it's about loving kids and discipling them into leadership. It's about bringing them to the foot of the cross. And Lord, we can all do that. It's not hard. It's, it just takes that commitment to invest time and energy into the life of someone else. So Lord, today we dedicate ourselves to this task. We look to the young people in our congregation and we pray that, that we will be worthy of this calling to shepherd them on this journey of faith. Thank you for the privilege of serving you in this capacity. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's sing together hymn number 10. Come Christians join to sing. Shall we stand?
Lord, we ask your blessing as we go from this place that our lives, so filled with the Spirit now, will we'll touch everyone we meet and spill just a little bit of your love and your grace and your goodness out. Well, Lord, may we have eyes to see the next generation as you do this week. Find one that we can love and bring in to the protection of the Father's house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.